Okay, hello and welcome to our event today. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of quick um, housekeeping points. Um, so just a note that this event is being recorded and will be available to watch on YouTube later if you do miss anything um, or you want to pass it on to a friend or colleague to catch up. Um, if you could keep yourself muted through the event so we can hear the speakers, that would be great. Um, but do feel free to keep your camera on if you'd like to. Um, we are going to have a Q&A at the end when you um, come to ask questions and hopefully you're going to have lots of questions for our speakers. Um, if you could just start your comment with um, Q just to let me know that it's a question and who your question is for, that would be really helpful. In terms of the agenda for today, um, we're going to start with an introduction to Wes and the week by Wes. We're going to hear from our northeast based We 50 winners. Then we'll move on to the um, If I can just ask everybody to mute themselves because there is a bit of background noise. Oh, they do a discount, do they? Excellent. Julie, I'm not sure if you're able to just um, mute all of the participants. Ah, so it's a oil and a sausage, don't Brilliant, thank you. Um, and yes, so I'll be chairing the session today. My name is uh, Joe Douglas Harris, and I'm the Wes Teas and Tyneside Cluster Coordinator. And I've got support in the background from Julie Harrison. So with that, I will hand over to Elizabeth, uh, Wes CEO. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'm delighted to be here as part of your event to celebrate the uh, women in the Northeast who are part of our top 50 women in engineering. Um, we've been through um, a strategy process in the last year to define where WES is going in the next century. And we're, we're going to chop it up into three year chunks. So we've agreed that our vision is of an engineering industry that employs the diversity of the society it serves to solve the biggest societal issues of our time. And our mission is to support women in engineering to fulfill their potential and support the engineering industry to be inclusive. We have set out what we'll do, and we'll do it against three stakeholder focused priorities. Our members, so we will support women in engineering at every stage of their career. Our partners, we will support businesses and institutions to attract and retain women in engineering. And our society, we will shape the engineering diversity debate in society with industry and with government. Next, please. So the top 50 women in engineering was inaugurated in 2016 when we celebrated the top 50 women who were making a contribution or were senior or in public life about engineering. And we decided in 2017 that if we continued to have the top 50 women in engineering, it would very soon become a competition of who was up, who was down, who was in, who was out. So we decided on a different theme each year. So in 2017, we focused on those under 35 making a difference. In 2018, to mark our collaboration with STEM returners, we looked at women who were returning from a, a career break or transferring from another field. In our centenary year in 2019, we looked at current and former apprentices because we wanted to show young women that you can have a fantastic career starting as an apprentice and end up being quite senior. I remember the gasps of astonishment from the current apprentices in the room when we introduced Dr. Catherine Critchley, who's one of our board members who had started out as an apprentice at Jugular Land Rover, showing that basically you can aim as high as you wish. In 2020, in response to the climate emergency, we looked at the top 50 women in sustainability. And in 2021, we looked at engineering heroes as our theme. More about that in a moment. And we've already agreed that for next year, we will have a theme of inventors and innovators. Those women engineers who have created or improved a product or process. And the most important thing about the We 50 is not just celebrating those women who are fantastic in their field, but they must also support women in engineering. So frequently we have applications from women who are terrific engineers, but they haven't demonstrated the work they've done for women in engineering. 
And equally, we have women who are fantastically supporting other women in their field, but they've been neglected to talk about the engineering piece that they do. And so this is why we believe the top 50 women in engineering awards are so special, because you must follow the criteria of the, of the, uh, of the year, but also to demonstrate your support for women in engineering. Next, please. So in 2021, we chose Engineering Heroes, and this was because we wanted to celebrate women engineers who stepped up during the pandemic. We know that a lot of women engineers, their first question when the pandemic hit was, what can I do to help? And we had a lot of women who were doing things like working with the ventilator challenge, creating PPE, converting uh, perfume factories to hand sanitizer, etc. But we also wanted to use that as a hook to celebrate women who've been doing this kind of thing for many years, including the emergency response after a, a flood or a, um, a devastating earthquake, those who've been keeping the public safe and we haven't really realized it. Things like the concrete barrier down the center of reservation and motorways actually designed by a woman uh, and it was designed so that the cars don't flip over into the other carriageway. And those who also develop life-saving medical responses and those who are responding to the climate emergency because we very much want to keep sustainability at the forefront of everything that we do. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce to you three fantastic women who have been engineering heroes. And firstly, we're going to hear from Andrea Pearson, who is a senior engineer at Fujifilm Diasynth Biotechnologies. In May, Pearson became a technical operations manager at Fujifilm Diasynth Biotechnologies, which manufactures the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine, among other biologics. But also during her maternity leave, Pearson started running the Teesside Cloth Nappy Library, helping about 100 local families convert to, be, to reusable nappies. And I'd like to hand over to Andrea. Hi, I hope you can hear me. Um, so I'm just going to give a little bit of a background as kind of how I've ended up where I am to begin with. And then I'll talk a bit about my current job and the Nappy Library, my side hustle. Um, so I'm a chemical engineer by background, um, studied at Manchester University quite a few too many years ago now, um, and then started my career um, in with Sabic Petrochemicals, so petrochemical industry. When I went into university, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I wanted to study engineering, but hadn't. I, I was from the Midlands. I'd never actually seen a chemical plant, um, didn't really know what career I was looking for, but did a placement year on oil refinery and realised sort of hands-on engineering on big scale kit was what I wanted to do. So I took a, up a graduate job here in the Northeast um, and then worked my way up through SABIC um, for the next 10 years and then eventually became an operations manager for their high hazard logistics assets. So um, this was five years ago. I was responsible for um, 50 people and running a, a, a port basically that imported 2 million tonnes of high hazard chemicals every year and I was responsible for all the people and the safe and reliable operation of it. Um, then I went off and had two children, um, came back from um, my first child, did um, some more project work, um, and then I was off having my second child on maternity leave when COVID happened. Um, so I wasn't actually at work at the time, but while I'd been off, um, my side hustle um, arrived. So I'd used reusable nappies with my first child, um, and I was part of a, a few, I bet a few people locally who'd also used them, who said, oh, we've got what we call a nappy library where we try and help other people convert to using reusable nappies. Would you like to be involved? And I was on maternity leave um, and thought, why not? I'll have a bit of spare time. Um, so I took over the nappy library. Um, then when COVID struck, um, I was already doing this. I, we'd got about two different hire kits. Basically, we just hire out nappies so that other parents can try them out before buying their own. Um, when COVID hit, um, you couldn't buy disposable nappies in the supermarkets, so our demand went through the roof. Um, I now run, um, I now have, sorry, nine volunteers across Teesside. We went from two kits to 25 kits in the space of um, a year. Um, I now help over 100 families a year um, with converting to reusable nappies and wipes, and we're saving upwards of 30 tonnes a year of waste locally going into our local um, incinerator. Um, and I continue to do that now alongside my job. So that was, in, particularly in COVID, that was, that was what kept me going, to be honest. I was off on maternity leave with two children stuck in the house um, during isolation. 
Um, when I went back to work um, after that maternity leave, um, I kind of decided it was time for a bit of a change. Um, I'd enjoyed my time in petrochemicals, loved um, being on a plant. Um, I'd done a lot of STEM work as well, trying to encourage local women particularly to come and work in a very male dominated chemical industry. Um, but partly because of COVID, I kind of decided actually maybe now was a bit of a time for a career change. I've looked around and discovered the biotechnology sector was booming um, in the Northeast um, and spotted a job here within Fujifilm Diocent Biotechnologies. So um, six months ago, I moved, had a complete career change, um, entirely different technology, um, but my, my background in operations management, people management um, and health, sort of health and safety where I'd been um, was looked at and the transferable skills were looked at favorably. Um, so I moved across here. You can see on the picture there, the, two, the, two, the comparison between the uh, first of protective equipment required for my previous job to my new one is rather different. Um, so now I run a team of um, up to 25 scientists and engineers um, who transfer technologies from sort of the lab scale up to 2000 litre batch scale. Um, and currently that is, we are manufacturing the Novavax COVID-19 vaccine on site. Um, so very different um, challenges, very different scale, completely different technology to what I, the rest of my career has been in, um, but very interesting. Um, yeah, entirely different. Um, we've had, we're incredibly busy with trying to deliver um, the COVID vaccine. Um, it's a little bit crazy, um, but really enjoyable. But everyone here is, it has been lovely and it's been really interesting. Um, I would definitely encourage people if at some point in your career you think I'd like a change, um, but not really quite sure whether to do the leap. I would encourage people to make that leap. Um, I, I brought upon skills I didn't really realize I had in my previous role, my previous company, um, to now bring on those um, in a completely new environment, new people um, and a new industry. Um, so yeah, so alongside um, work and Nappy Library, um, things I really, I enjoy encouraging, um, particularly women, and local women to try and come into science and, science and technology and engineering roles um, locally and nationwide. I'm also a volunteer for the local WES cluster here in the Northeast um, and enjoy working alongside all the other fantastic women there to try and do what we can to try and encourage more women to come and work in our sector. Um, biotechnology is clearly booming, particularly post COVID. There are loads of opportunities um, in the sector nationwide. Um, so yeah, I'm always happy to encourage people to come and look at the industry and see what things we might have to offer them. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Andrea, and congratulations on your win. Well deserved. Thank you. Now my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Olson, who is a PhD researcher at Newcastle University. After leaving school at the age of 10 due to bully bullying and poor schooling, Olson did her GCSEs independently and applied for the Talent 2030 National Engineering Competition. She designed a new prosthetic elbow and began a career in mechanical engineering. Her current project focuses on improving the design of upper limb prosthetics to make them cheaper, more reliable and comfortable. She's also a founding member of Newcastle University's new Fem Eng Society. And from a, you know, to, to understand that she had to leave school at such a young age, to now be a PhD researcher shows that anything's possible. So thank you, welcome, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Ah. So um, yes, uh, hi everyone, my name is Jenny. And as Elizabeth said, I am a PhD researcher looking at upper limb prosthetics at Newcastle University. And before that, I did mechanical engineering, that's my background. Um, but I took, I would say, a slightly unconventional route into engineering. So I thought I would just talk a little bit about that and then what I do. Um, and then some questions I get asked quite a lot. Um, so as mentioned, I was homeschooled um, between, uh, basically for all of secondary school. And this was like before the pandemic made it like normal to be homeschooled. This is when it was very uncool to be homeschooled. Um, and that was just because like the schools where I, where I live were not very good and the bullying was really bad and I wanted to live. So I didn't go to school. Um, so um, that was a bit of a change. And I taught myself for the majority of that. And I was just really interested in everything. I was like a sponge, just want to know everything, learn everything but I had no direction I didn't know what I wanted to do um I like making things I like designing things but I didn't really know like what kind of career that would be 
Um, and, and very lucky, there was a STEM outreach coordinator at my sixth form at Newcastle Sixth Form who said to me, Jenny, there's this competition. Uh, it's run by Town 2030. It's for young female engineer of the year. I think you should enter it. I think you'd be really good at it. And I was a bit like, don't really know what an engineer is. Uh, I would have thought that was like cars, planes, trains. And, and don't get me wrong, I love Formula One, but cars don't really want to go and work on them. Um, but I looked at the previous winners and I looked at the girls who'd won it in the past. And they designed things like emergency shelters that were being used in refugee camps and medical devices. And it was just like a light bulb moment for me because I realised there's engineers everywhere. It's not just cars. It's not just planes. You can actually go and design anything. And, and that's an engineer. And that was just a total turning point. Um, I designed this new type of prosthetic elbow because I'm interested in, in medicine and things like that. And I went on to win it, which was amazing because I went in six months from not really knowing what an engineer was to being young female engineer of the year. So that was huge for me. Um, so knowing that I want to do biomedical engineering, I went on to do mechanical engineering at university, which again was a bit of a culture shock. I, because I hadn't wanted to be an engineer from a young age, I wasn't really prepared for it. I'd never done physics. I'd never done mechanics. Um, luckily, I was just like sort of using my maths and trying to get through everything with that. But, you know, you learn along the way and it was it was really good. And I was really lucky that there was actually a PhD position opened up in a lab at Newcastle that I wanted to work with um, at the end of my degree. So it's crazy to think that like three and a half years after winning that award in college I'm now doing a PhD in biomedical engineering so I think you know I really got lucky there <laughs> but it was I really like what I work in uh, and what I do now is I look at upper limb prosthetics which most people would know as like a bionic arm um, and see whether we can make them better using engineering and as with anything you know if you don't work in it or if you don't use a prosthetic device you know you wouldn't know the ins and outs of it but a lot of people have this image from like sci-fi, things like Iron Man and, and Westworld, that we've got these amazing prosthetic arms that are like mind controlled and they work just like a, a regular arm. And, you know, it couldn't be further from the truth because those things do exist in, in research labs. You know, people are looking into like brain control devices and, and total sci-fi stuff like that. But the reality is they're not very reliable and we can't take those out into the real world yet. And it's very, very expensive. So because of the things like budget constraints on the NHS, they can't prescribe something if it's not reliable and if it doesn't work um, every single time. And if it's likely to get abandoned by the person using it, they cannot prescribe that because of the astronomical costs that these devices have. Um, if you're looking to go private with a prosthetic arm, I mean, there's companies, startups who've brought in um, ones around the £10,000 mark, and that's cheap. If, if you want a, you know, a high tech one, you're talking £100,000, and that's just not acceptable that healthcare should cost that much, because it is healthcare. And this is why the NHS can't prescribe them currently when they're not that reliable. So what I'm trying to do is use engineering, um, particularly for the socket, because I am from a mechanical background, but just in general to try and make prosthetic um, devices more accessible? Can we improve their design? Can we make them more reliable? Can we as researchers do the testing to prove that they are reliable so that they can be prescribed on the NHS and can make them more accessible? Um, so that's what I do and I love my job and I'm really lucky to be where I am right now. Um, but I just thought I would answer some questions. That's me in the corner with my Wes Award. That is like a treasure now. <laughs> so just thought I'd answer a few questions. Um, and one of the things that uh, I get asked a lot is like, what, what's the point of these awards? What's the point of these organisations like WARES, like Town 2030, that are aimed at bringing minorities, whether it's a gender minority or whether it's like a racial minority, what's the point of these things? Why do we still need them, you know, in 2021? And I mean, I say the same thing, which is I wouldn't be an engineer if I wasn't brought in through this competition, this Town 2030 competition, I wouldn't even know what one was. I'd have probably been like a vet or a, a kids writer or something, you know. I wouldn't have had a clue that there's this career out there that fits all of the things I like doing. I like designing things, I like making things, I like helping people, I like using math and, and that's a job. I wouldn't know that without this kind of organisation like Town 2030. So for me, it's just been like, it changed my whole life. I know it sounds like cheesy, but it did. It completely changed my career trajectory. And I think as an adult, winning the the Wii 50 has just been huge like I've never known anything like it I've been contacted by people who I look up to and they're interested in my work and they want to know what I'm doing and they're interviewing me and doing podcasts and it's just been amazing um so I think that's just been a real boost to me 
motivation you know it's been a tough year in the pandemic and I think just getting that has just been you know such a nice little lift and like I say the interviews as well one question I get asked a lot in these interviews is what's in store for the future of medical engineering and I think that's a huge question um I am nowhere near qualified to answer that but I will try <laughs> so um personally from my point of view um like I say we see a lot in sci-fi which does affect medical engineering because people have this false perception that it's there and the technology's there. Um, but I think a lot of people like me are quite frustrated that these devices exist, but they're not accessible to people. And I think we've got a lot of people now who want to get them into homes. They want to get them helping the people that they're designed to help. And I think, you know, things haven't changed in prosthetics significantly well in upper limb for about 60 years and I think we are actually about to see some change because I think there's a lot of people who want to get these things out into people's lives and being useful um so that's what I think is going to happen we're going to start seeing the sci-fi actually moving into day-to-day -day life within the next decade or so or at least that's what I'm hoping for because that's why we do it is to help people um and another thing I get asked all the time and I don't know why because I'm again nowhere near qualified to answer this is like what's your best advice and I'm like I am still a student so whether you want to take advice from me is you know up to you <laughs> um but I do a lot of work in schools particularly in the local area you know with not having such a good experience with school myself I really want to reach out to those kids who aren't doing well in school and don't thrive in that environment and and I always say the same thing which is do not be afraid to get things wrong and don't be afraid to look silly because personally this is something I struggle with all the time if I'm at a conference people will you know be asking questions and I'm terrified to ask a question because I think they're going to think I'm silly they're going to think I'm stupid they're going to think I don't know anything and the imposter syndrome just creeps in and I don't ask and you know and somebody told me like you know you're only going to look stupid once you're going to put your hand up and then you know and then you've learned that and instead of doing something wrong for the rest of your life you know it, it took that one time to be brave and ever since then I've been it just totally changed my perception and going into schools I do think this is a gender issue I see a lot of kids mainly the boys who are happy to put their hands up and get things wrong again and again and again and it doesn't phase them they don't mind getting things wrong and that's brilliant I always say to kids I don't care if it's wrong just tell me what's going on in your brain but I do see the girls they they will only put their hand up if they 100% know that they're right and they're not going to look silly and I've experienced that at university if I put my hand up and I got something wrong I get laughed at and people would say you're only here you know diversity higher you know it's because you're local it's because you're from the northeast it's you know it's because you're a girl and but whereas other people could get things wrong again and again and again nothing said and I do think that trickles down into schools and I think we have to make sure that we're telling our girls all children but particularly girls that it's okay to get things wrong you know what if people laugh at you that's them being horrible you know you're going to learn something from that and, and they're not so yeah that's that's me and that's um what I've got to share on engineering so <laughs> hopefully you found that interesting about prosthetic arms <laughs> thank you Jenny that was absolutely fascinating and and I want to say that um absolutely ask questions and get things wrong number one um, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's just the person brave enough to ask the question that everyone else is saying, is it me or is this complete rubbish or whatever? Or I don't really understand that. And um, and it, it really does take great confidence. And I'm sorry that you had all of this, oh, you're, you're wrong, because actually we learn through failure. And in engineering, that's more evident. So whenever we, when something doesn't work, we say, ah, oh, well, that didn't work. We'll have to try something else. And, and you know, we, we are built as engineers by learning through failure. So yes, do ask questions. But wow, what an amazing things you're doing. And I'm so glad that you're going to be at the forefront of this sci-fi technology <laughs> kind of coming to, to our world. Um, and, and for things like being able to, to make a prosthetic arm at like a, a human one. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. And last but not least, um, Dr. Tanaz Pak, who is a senior lecturer in engineering at Teesside University. Uh, Pak's research has provided new insights within energy and water engineering and contributed to several sustainable development goals set out by the United Nations. As the principal investigator, she leads three international engineering research projects funded by the Global Challenges Research Fund, the British Council, and the British Academy, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to her now. Tanas. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so it's a pleasure to be here talking to you, and I've been really delighted to um, to have been one of the winners of We50 Award this year, and it's really given me so much more confidence to go out and talk to um, other women and girls about how to sort of um, aim high and push for um, what they really want to achieve. So I thought I, I'd start from just giving you a, a really brief introduction on how I got to why, where I am at the moment. So I started off um, studying uh, an engineering degree uh, back in Iran. I'm originally from Iran. And um, that was um, like a, more like a general engineering degree. It had um, some chemical engineering in it, some materials engineering in it, some uh, electrical engineering in it. So it gave me a really good insight into what engineering is all about. Um, so, but I, from early stages, I knew I really like to work with material and really find different applications for, for material. Um, so started off by looking um, energy in general. So I did um, geosciences engineering uh, in my master's in France. That was in I IFP school. It's a really great experience for me as an exchange student, new, um, all sorts of new experiences for me studying in a new country, new culture. So um, then that took me to um, wanting to do a PhD in um, geosciences. And I did that uh, at Edinburgh University School of Geosciences, really um, excellent place and really, um, really great team that I worked with. I was, um, I was really and sort of lucky to to do my project as part of a team rather than an, as an isolated researcher. So that gave me a lot of um, sort of edge to develop myself and all my skills as well. So then I joined Teesside University as a lecturer in engineering, um, mainly looking at energy, oil and gas, um, sort of subsurface harvesting energy from subsurface environments. Um, so I did that um, for a year. I did um, start to look into, this was part of my job so I had to do it, another degree in uh, higher education and um, teaching and learning um, that um, sort of helped me to become a fellow of advanced HE that's a, a professional scheme to sort of um, advancing higher education uh, practice that really helped me in terms of improving what I do as a lecturer. Um, then with that, um, as well as uh, some of the experiences I gained, I, I was promoted to a senior lecturer in 2015. Uh, then I turned my attention into getting involved in uh, with professional bodies. And I think um, with um, engineering careers uh, now uh, more than ever, um, it's really great um, opportunity to really associate yourselves with a professional body. And there are so many different ones. There's obviously one for, um, you might have heard the iChemy or iMechy ones, the um, Institute of Chemical or Mechanical Engineering ones. I chose to um, become a member of IOM3, that's the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining. Again, going back to the desire that I had to work with materials. And so between 2017, so I, I became a chartered engineer, which is a really great, uh, I think, uh, addition to, uh, it's, it's more like a professional qualification. Um, and it is really helping you to uh, get in touch with other uh, groups of engineers and, and network and learn quite a lot more and get exposed to quite a lot more. So if I, um, then I, I in 2021, uh, obviously I won the We50 Award, but I want to talk about what happened between in, in the past five years. So if I can have the next slide. Oh, am I the host now? No. Hello. Is it still showing the, the original slide? I have moved it on. Is yes, it, I can only see the, the original. Yeah. Successful research projects now, tell us. Uh, yeah, now, yeah, yeah, I can see it now. Um, so, so what I thought might be interesting to share with you is some of the things that I have been successful in, but also um, share with you some of the uh, projects that I've tried really my best with, but they haven't been successful. And I think what you see mostly is the successful parts of, of um, people's careers, but, but maybe there's quite a lot more behind the scenes. So what happened um, with um, starting off with, with an academic, it's really difficult to become an independent researcher. So um, it's really difficult to get the, the first couple of um, 
projects that you run as a as an independent researcher and um, i guess um, adding on to what andrea had to say changing to, uh, subject areas as well with what was happening in the energy industry going away from fossil fuels moving towards more sustainable ways of um, um, energy and the decarbonization agenda that we have i had to really sort of try to find myself um, and my skill the, the skills that i have and try to um, sort of find new research areas so in the beginning um building on what I had known from my PhD, I, I managed to win a, a research project funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering. That was a really nice project that had collaborators from Brazil, from my former PhD supervisor, who was who's, who's just a fantastic person to work with. Um, so I had that, um, I developed that ne network a, a little bit further, but then um, I looked um, outside oil and gas, I look towards subsurface environments still, but looking at groundwater. And I really, this is a su subject that is very close to my heart as well. So uh, providing, supplying, supplying clean water for the communities that rely on groundwater as their main source of water supply. Um, and we've had lots of uh, industrial activities over the past century that has really contaminated groundwater globally. So um, doing that in a way that's more sustainable. So finding new technologies, looking at new material, that was the motivation of the next two projects that I managed to sort of um, um, sort of win and, and uh, deliver. And in all of these projects that I have tried to sort of uh, put together, I've tried to be the uh, principal investigator as well for myself to sort of develop all of that skills in myself. Um, and to really be able to develop network and, and work with fantastic people as well. So um, afterwards, after that, I looked at uh, another, again, going back to the, to the material um, angle and material perspective that I was really uh, interested in. I'm now looking at biomass and harvesting energy from biomass and, and bioenergy and biofuel in general, but also looking at um, really um, adding value by uh, looking at uh, materials such as biochar. Uh, so this is a new material that um, it's a, it's a charcoal-like material that basically provides you with lots of capacity to sequester carbon, so delivering um, net zero targets, but also looking at water filtration, improving soil properties. So all of those. And I was um, lucky to, to um, basically have projects with uh, really nice people, um, international collaborations funded by uh, British Council, the British Academy, um, as well as recently uh, funded by the Time Project, UKRI in the UK. So if I can have the next um, slide. So behind all of these, I, I thought it would be nice to share with you some of the unsuccessful um, experiences that I have really. Um, um, if I, I would have looked at those as really big failures at the time when those happened. Um, so especially, I mean, you can see uh, the timeline of that as well here, but especially when I was starting off my career as an academic, I, I developed a project um, and submitted it um, to the new investigator award to EPSRC. Um, and um, that's um, that basically is the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK. And I thought uh, at the time that I had done a really good job, but that turned out to be an, uh, an unsuccessful experience. And I was really disheartened to, to have that sort of, I, I looked at it as a failure at the time. And it took a lot of courage for me to sort of pull myself together and, and start looking at other topics and maybe redoing it or uh, reattempting it. But that project was actually later funded by two other schemes. So it was... Um, looking at all of what happened here and you can see quite a few other ones that I've tried and um, for example the 2019 project that you can see at the top um, this was a first attempt and a second attempt and on the third attempt we were successful uh, but you can see all um, some some other projects that um, I, as I was developing those um, I really managed to do quite a lot of um, development in general in terms of the research idea in, ter in terms of innovation in terms of what what needs to be done to actually achieve um, a new solution. So when I now reflect back, all of these that were unsuccessful, they were really building bridges to, to get to other uh, more successful experiences, which is quite interesting um, to me 
on reflection um, that everything you have to look at everything as part of a package so if we can have the next so so for me if i want to sort of share some of the things that i have learned that have been really useful i think it's really helpful to um look at developing collaborations internationally mainly uh, has been successful for me as well as well as um, obviously collaborations in the UK that I've had uh, but uh, collaboration networks help you work with people and learn from all sorts of different subject areas and it, it will in inspire you in the ways you wouldn't have thought um, specifically also I think getting involved in scientific organizations are um, really nice opportunities for me me, I um, worked with Interport, that's the International Society of Porous Media, um, from early stages of my academic life. And I really enjoyed um, developing um, basically collaborations through that, but also um, having this uh, personal face to face face and, and also now more recently online interactions with researchers getting to have informal discussions with them as well and developing ideas and, and planting seeds in, in people's mind of um, how you're going to sort of take your um, career forward and um, also I think um, doing things yourself that might look like challenging. So for instance, obviously um, researchers attend conferences and, and publish and, and do all, all sorts of those, but or taking challenges like organizing um, conferences and events that um, need quite a lot of work in the background, but those have given me really good experiences. So I, I did two specifically. I did one in, in Brazil in collaboration with my partners in Brazil, and you can see a picture of this was in um, the Brazilian synchrotron. Um, in 2018, I think. And then we had another one at Teesside University. Um, again, this was through Interpol. And those conferences gave me quite a lot of, gave me a platform to sort of engage with industry, with other um, academics, and, and really form new ideas and, and really start to look at new, um, new subject areas. And then again, taking having a mentor from early stages, and I had um, the opportunity of having a mentor who who wasn't really, um, a really. This wasn't a formal mentorship sort of uh, meeting every Wednesday and and sort of catching up, but this was a very delicate way of uh, a professor in our university sort of offered his help um, in engineering department uh, in a really um, sort of. Um, constructive way all the way through and that really I think has given me insights into things that I wouldn't really have known uh, as a young researcher um, so that I really recommend um, everyone to get involved into having a mentor find a good mentor talk to them um, to sort of um, get them to uh, to sort of help you in 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 all sorts of challenges you're dealing with and then um, specifically I mean this is um, this you need to see what your line of career is but for me, working in um, external laboratories, specifically in synchrotron laboratories, you can see two pictures in, in the bottom of this slide. One is uh, the middle one is the Brazilian synchrotron and the left one is the UK synchrotron. For me, going to these um, really uh, massive scale research facilities and working there um, with other with group of researchers, this the work happens 24 seven when you visit such a facility and really getting to um, feel everything and, and work hard intensively in a short space of time. That was um, very beneficial for me in terms of developing all sorts of um, all sorts of skills, but also staying at the forefront of what's happening in research. So if I can have my last slide, so I thought um, I just briefly mentioned this, I think I don't have much more time, but in general, um, this is the um, line of research that I've been looking at, um, building on the sustainable development goals that um, Elizabeth mentioned. Um, so um, this is set by the United Nations, and you can see in the right, there are many of those goals, but specifically, I look at the ones that contribute to clean water, to the climate, to soil, um, to energy, clean energy, 
And as part of this, I look at uh, biochar as a material that really delivers um, a solution for um, a wide range of those problems. And we, we've, we all have seen what happened in, in COP26, and we are all looking forward to new technologies that uh, would help us um, really achieve net zero and, and decarbonization. So by doing this research, I've try to really look at this new material, this, uh, this advanced material in a way to optimize its properties to deliver on um, soil enhancement, water treatment, but also uh, CO2 sequestration. So I thought I would share that as well. So that's the end of my slides, but I uh, really um, um, I thank everyone to, um, who was behind this um, the award itself, but also this event. Happy to respond to any questions you may have. I think that's fantastic, um, Tenaz, and I'm so impressed with what you've been doing, and I'm impressed with all three of the We 50 winners. I'm very proud that we've honoured them in this way. And uh, now it's uh, over to Joe. Thanks, Elizabeth, and thank you to all of us, because it's just really, really interesting to hear about your journeys. I wonder if we could start with a question for everybody around if you have any advice for anybody who is thinking about nominating themselves or somebody else for an award like the the we 50. do it just do it <laughs> just, yeah. just, just nominate yourself um i was really lucky that actually my supervisor encouraged me to nominate myself because i wouldn't have, have, have thought about doing it before that i would have thought i'm too early in my career you know technically still a student even though it is kind of a job um but now I've honestly been telling everybody like just just do it just nominate yourself it, it's not a long um application process but it is a meaningful one you really have to sum up everything that you do in in quite a short space and I think it's a really good um it's a really good way to reflect on everything you've done like I've I forgot quite a lot of the stuff I'd done and um yeah there's there's people who are now like nominate yourself because you know you, you deserve this you know you deserve to be celebrated what you've done so yeah do it <laughs> absolutely and um we do encourage self-nomination because we know some women can't find champions so do nominate yourself you've got 400 words that's exact and it's calculated using microsoft word and i literally go through every application i have a little program that counts all the words and cuts off at the 400th word and says citation and so do make sure it's under 400 words um but also you've got to remember how you fit the criteria and how you're supporting women in engineering if you're specifically going for the WE50. But put yourself forward, put other women forward if you think they're reluctant or encourage them to apply. Uh, and um, also just to let you know that uh, the, we anonymize all the entries. So what the judges will see is the first name and the level of their career and then the 400 words. So unless your full name is quoted or your company's quoted in your citation and you don't have to do that, uh, we won't know who you are. And one of the nicest things is when we unblind them and we see who the winners are, and we're like, oh, I'm so excited that these people have won because I might have come across them, but definitely apply. I'd, I'd encourage that too. Um, I was lucky enough to have someone who I actually barely knew, Norman, put me forward. But since then, it made me think about actually, are there other women I know that I've put forward a colleague for an award who then won, uh, which I never would have done um, if I hadn't, if the other person hadn't put me forward for this when I thought there was no way that I would qualify for this kind of an award. Um, so yeah, so definitely pass, pass, up, pass it on as well. Yeah, because the worst thing that's going to happen is you're not going to win. Exactly. <laughs> the best thing that's going to happen is you win. You can't win unless you're in. Yeah. Right, we've got a question for Jenny. Um, in for biomedical engineer, um, engineering, do you need to have biology? So short answer, no. Um, so there's there's a lot of. Um, so I work in a really diverse team. So we've got people from a maths background, we've got people from a neuroscience background, we've got people from computer science, um, people who came from different streams of engineering. So if you're going for biomedical engineering as a career, absolutely not. You can come from any angle. There's lots of different aspects, as with any engineering. The thing that you work on might have no biology involved. Um, but as a student, it does help. So if you're looking to study it at university, um, as I mentioned before, I didn't do physics, didn't do mechanics. So I was a little bit on the back foot with a lot of the traditional engineering elements but then as it got to the later years and we're talking about things like material science how things interact with humans human body 
and biomedical engineering that's when I really came into my own because I did have that biology background I did have that chemistry background so I was like ah, I know these things so it does help if you're going to study it um but to get involved absolutely not you can come from from any background brilliant and a, a question for Tanaz do you have any advice for a new lecturer on being successful with research grants or how to best learn from failures Right. This is a this is a tough question to answer. And I think um, everyone will in, a, in an academic career will uh, will experience failure. Uh, it, it doesn't matter what the stage in their career they are, because it's just so um, the, the competition is really hard and uh, there's just not enough um, research funding available. So everyone wants to um, really try their best. And people are getting good at it in writing research proposals. Uh, there are now quite a lot of resources in terms of how to write a really good bid. Um, so you're now competing against people who know what it really they are doing in terms of um, developing that proposal and developing that research program. But I would say that um, if, if you reflect on um, why you have uh, been perhaps not successful in, in the first or second instance, and uh, the first thing to do after, after I get uh, rejected in any instance, the first thing to do is, is to go back and ask for feedback. So why was it? Sometimes they, they won't be able to provide you with feedback because there's just so many uh, applicants uh, that they, they would sometimes provide batch feedback about. So in general, look at this and that and that and see which one you need to improve. Um, sometimes you need to have a little bit of track record in that area. So you need to perhaps work on your collaborations, work on your publications in that specific area um, to sort of um, have the confidence that is required. Um, but also, I think you have to give yourself a little bit of time to rework what you have been a bit uh, perhaps unsuccessful in and try to go back and try again a different call um, from a different angle and sometimes if you try again and again I, and I explained one example that I, I have had I, I had to go back three times um, and on the third time lucky I, I, I managed to do that but, but I really wanted to go back and each time I took the feedback on board I developed a bit that was a, a little bit weaker um, in their opinion and I, I managed in the end but I think um, it would be really useful to, uh, to try to reflect on the feedback sometimes the the program you are applying for is, is not suitable so you have to find a better program better call read the call really carefully sometimes there are hidden things that you haven't really taken on board and also ask for others to read your proposal and give you feedback before you actually go ahead and submit it. So these are the areas I think that you, you'll be able to, to look into. Brilliant. And then we've got a question for Andrea. What steps do you think in, um, need to be taken to encourage greater use of reusable nappies? Well, I think, well, I, I'm talking to someone who runs a nappy library, I'd say encouraging more nappy libraries because the world of reusable nappies is complicated and there is a lot of choice out there and every child and family will suit a different brand and type so I think it, a lot of areas give council councils give out funding to help people go and buy them because they're not cheap on the outset um, and I think people councils working along with nappy libraries so that people can get vouchers but also get the help and advice they need is the way people get converted because without someone there just to give you a bit of help you're unlikely to be successful just doing it on your own, unfortunately, um, which is the reality. Um, but I, I also helped with the UK Nappy Network. There's a network of all the libraries across the UK trying to help each other and encourage each other. Um, and that's, that's good. But we're also trying to lobby government to give out grants and to try and encourage more people to convert. Because a lot of people, once they try it, realise it's not that difficult. And actually washing them isn't that much of an effort. Um, and actually you do save money overall. Most families will save sort of up to five, 500 or a thousand pounds on nappies by using them. Um, and obviously it's much better for the environment. Um, yeah. Ah. And then we've got a question for Elizabeth. Does WERS have a strategy or does it receive any Department for Education support for sharing stories and achievements across the pre-higher and pre-further education fields nationally? And I think this is linked to the schools um, that Jennifer had mentioned and if the um, the person who's asked the questions also asked if participants feel whether nationally sharing examples of these messages could positively influence children at the most crucially important stage of considering GCSE options. 
Uh, yes, and um, we made a decision in 2018 not to do any more outreach to children under 18 because um, we're a team of six and we don't really have a lot of the resource and there are a lot of organisations who are in that space um, uh, who are, you know, from primary and secondary engineer um, to lots of companies who've got that and we just felt that the return for our investment would not be um, something that we could quantify because when we did a big census two years ago, and we said, what got you into engineering? Um, a teacher or a, an outreach program came down quite low. Now, we do know that they have an effect because then they get encouraged in other ways, um, but it, it's very difficult to tangibly say, yes, Wes did this thing, and therefore I responded and became an engineer. What we do have is the She's an Engineer facility on our website, uh, where it has lots of profiles of amazing women in lots of different areas of uh, engineering, uh, and that, is a way of saying this is what you can do and how you can do it. Now, it's a little bit hidden on our website at the moment, but we are having a massive website revamp in the next couple of months so that hopefully the beginning of 2022, you'll see these things much more prominently and you'll be able to say, oh, wow, who's that? And actually, one of the things I really like to be doing is talking to our We 50 because we already have so much information about them and seeing how we can, uh, you know, we've got their photo, we've got their, their short citation, we've got their long citation. Maybe we could do a little bit more with them without much more effort on their part to show that she's an engineer, but that's something we'd definitely be looking into. Uh, but thanks for asking. Angie, you talked about moving industry and those transferable skills. How do you go about sort of identifying the skills that you have and then selling them when it is such a big move? <laughs> so I was quite lucky. The job I applied for had a very detailed um, person specification. And I think some companies do that. Um, and there was a lot of things on there that were very sort of transferable in a sense, you know, just soft skills rather than the actual technical detail or knowledge of the particular industry. Um, so I, if, if, the, if a job advert doesn't have that, I'd encourage people to go and talk to someone in the company go and network with ideally someone like the hiring manager but or just other in my case it'd be engineers or or scientists in the company that you might be interested in working in um i'd had this company fujifilm on my radar for a little while and i kept an eye on the careers page um and i just sort of gone through you know what what things have i used in my career management stuff soft skills in in some things like in incident investigations some of my health and safety work um, which I knew would be applicable and try and concentrate on that and not concentrate so much on my lack of biotechnology and my AS biology, which is now coming in very useful, which feels like a very long time ago. Um, so yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd get encouraged really talking to hiring managers and, and recruitment people. Um, they tend to be very open if, some, if you've got applicants interested in your company and you can show that you're genuinely interested and you've researched what you're looking for, then I found that they tend to be very open to having that conversation and helping you see what skills you have that could, you could bring into the organisation. I'm, I'm actively trying to recruit for people not from biotechnology to come into my team. So yeah, I can see it from that point of view now as well. And maybe a question for all of the speakers is, uh, what, what do you think is going to be coming next for you? Where do you see your careers going? Um, <laughs> so um, for me, I'm obviously still a student so I'm going to be finishing hopefully fingers crossed finishing my PhD um, and then who knows I mean I'm looking at either going into maybe a company and sharing what I've learned from my research in a prosthetics company there's not that many most of them are startups um, so you know keeping it like any, anybody looking to hire in around two years time I'm here um, but um, also potentially looking at more moving into like the clinical side because um, I like working with people so that might be something I'd look at um, but yeah who knows what the future holds I think every plan I've had I've always changed what I'm going to do anyway so not really any point anymore is there? <laughs> just to see what comes up around the time. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think I think uh, the same way because um, it's it's proven to be everything proven has proven to be very dynamic in the past um, at least the past two years and we've learned quite a um, wide range of um, new skills all of us um, and these all can contribute to taking us to really different places than what we thought maybe a few years back uh, but I think looking at what I have um, tried to achieve so far and I, I think I'm I'm really enjoying my uh, my um, job at as well as um, the work-life balance that working in an academia actually gives you. Um, and the fact that um, maybe adding to what Andrea had to say about trying to change um, subject areas totally, as an academic, that's a little bit easier because you obviously um, can contribute to the engineering department in general, uh, but you're a little bit more flexible in terms of um, changing areas that you're now researching on or, or trying to contribute to. So so, um, so as we go into um, sort of looking at more um, um, adding to the sustainability agenda that we have in, in the UK and, and globally, really, um, I'm really interested in looking into contributing to net zero and decarbonisation even more in a couple of years from now. Uh, but I think um, I'm, I'm happy in terms of keeping the academic life for now. But let's see what happens. <laughs> I think I'd echo partly what you just said there. I'm, I'm, I'm obviously in a biotechnology company, but I'm, my side passion with, with nappies is sort of the sustainability and, and net zero focus of the future. Part of the reason I moved industries was I was looking to be a bit more future focused um, and looking at industries that are expanding and really helping to solve some of the problems of the world. Um, I'm, but the way we make vaccines is using single use plastic technology. Um, which is obviously not brilliantly sustainable. Um, so I'd like to think now I'm getting my head around and guess I to understand this industry and, and um, my new job. I'd like to think maybe in the future, something like that. So looking at some of the sustainability aspects of what we do in our manufacturing. Um, and I guess for me, I've only been here six months. So try and <laughs> just get, get used to the job, work out what I'm doing and see what other opportunities there might be in an entirely new industry. But it certainly showed me that moving industries is very doable, which I had, if you told me um, a couple of years ago, that's what this is what I'd be doing now, I would definitely not, not have believed you. So anything is anything is potentially possible when you can sell yourself on your um, transferable skills, that's for sure. Yeah, and I, yeah. I'll say that um, when I first started work 30 years ago, I was a brochure distribution assistant for Thompson Tour Operators. That job doesn't exist anymore because we don't really send brochures out to travel agents because people book online. So wherever your career is, it's likely that you're, you're, you may end up in a job that hasn't even been invented yet. Uh, and I like what Jennifer was saying about, you know, it being dynamic and seeing what comes up. The advice I give is always don't close the door unless you have to. And sometimes you do have to close the door in order to specialise, but if you can leave something open, then leave it open. And as Andrea's done, use your side passions to, to create good jobs, because I was very heavily involved in politics for the first 20 years of my career, and that got me into engineering indirectly because I was working with a trade union and somebody at Rolls-Royce said, come and lobby the government for us. And I learned all about aerospace engineering, uh, and it all went from there. As for myself, um, my ambitions really are for WES. Um, we we only made a, a very small loss during the pandemic, but, but we in overall, but we lost one hundred and fifty thousand pounds of our income, but our expenditure came down as well. And now we're doing much better. And so my plan really is to make ways the best it can be over the next three or four years. Um, and um, I'll I'll be chief exec until I get bored, or until the board don't want me anymore, depending on which comes first. Uh, but you know, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much to all of our speakers today. Um, just before we go, I will flag that there is a request in the chat. Um, Julie is working with a charity that is going into primary schools to work with girls in disadvantaged areas to show them how they can work in STEM and would the speakers be willing to get involved so if you are then um, hopefully you can um, manage to, to chat offline and sort something out there. So yes thank you so much um, to all of our speakers today and to Elizabeth for joining us and giving us the, um, the wider context of the, the We 50 awards and a bit of a sneak peek of what the awards are going to be for next year.
Um, thank you to everybody behind the scenes, um, members of the West Cluster Committee up here, and obviously Julie, who's helped out today. And um, thank you all for joining us in your lunchtime. I hope you found it useful. And if you have enjoyed it and you do want to pass it on to others, then um, we'll be sending out the YouTube link later on. So thanks very much. Thank you to you as well, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye.